Okay, we understand the president is getting ready to speak. Uh, the crowd is standing. Let's take a listen in. A sixth term inside wire apprentice and an employee of O'Neill Electric. Um, I'm a proud member of the IBW Local 48 here in Portland. <laughs> I've been honored to be a member of the community of workers transforming PDX, and I have marveled at the feats of modern engineering carefully reworking this space into a concourse of the future. They say this project, built with the help of federal, federal infrastructure dollars, will fuel industries, tourism, and allow the region's economic engine to take flight. I see this airport as an opportunity to hone my craft alongside the best workers in the world. This airport is an opportunity, excuse me, this airport is the firm foundation for families to grow and flourish. I grew up in a single parent home. My mother often went hungry so that I could eat. She had jobs, college degree, but no health insurance. We had a car, but not really any money for major repairs. I myself have been a barista, a TSA agent, an officer, and even for a short time, a professional mountain biker. That was fun. Uh, I could have taken one of a million paths. Uh, what drew me to Oregon is the wide open spaces. It was only by chance that I ended up an electrician. That's awesome. Uh, and that chance has brought me to the IBEW. To me, not only is this project a symbol of modern advancement and ingenuity, it is the vehicle for the promise of a better life. This airport is a landmark. I will forever drive by and see it as a symbol of how far I've come. Projects like this change lives and keep Oregon moving forward. Today I can buy new boots, or even the latest and greatest mountain bike. But more importantly, I have health care, I have a pension, and I have the security of good pay. And that extra income, I can take my mom grocery shopping whatever she wants. Yes. The, the financial security that I have to take care of my family is what's important, and that's what this job means to me. The bipartisan infrastructure law that passed last year is not just an investment in infrastructure. It is also an investment in good union jobs. It's an investment in good schools and strong communities. It's an investment in me and my union. The men and women of the IBEW, we're just getting started. Yes. We are ready to rebuild the I-5 bridge over the Columbia River and modernize the Port Marine terminals and upgrade the container cranes that are so essential to this region's commerce. And of course, finish this airport, making it a jewel of the Pacific Northwest. We are ready to build America back better. And we are so proud to have a president who understands that building America back better means building union. And now, it is my absolute honor to introduce you to the President of the United States, President Joe Biden. Please, have a seat if you have one. Thank you all very much. It's great to be back in Portland. It's great to, and I, Lauren, thank you very much for that introduction. And Mayor Wheeler, thanks for the passport into the city. Being a mayor is the toughest job in American politics. They know where you live, <laughs> and they, uh, everything that affects them, they look to you for answers. Governor Brown, thank you for welcoming me back to Oregon. And, Colonel, I want to thank you and the 142nd Wing of the Red Hawks of, of Oregon and the Air National Guard for hosting us in the, at the base today. We're making a lot of work for you. I understand that. I also want to thank Oregon's outstanding members of Congress, Ron Wyden. Ron, uh, Ron has been a leader in the Senate fighting for clean energy and jobs for a long time. And now he's a chairman of a finance committee, which makes him the king of the Senate. Uh, but uh, we're going to make sure that teachers and firefighters 
don't pay a higher tax than billionaires, which in many cases they do. We're going to get it done, Ron. We're going to get it done. And Senator Jeff Merkley, a leader on climate and foreign policy, and, you know, we, uh, what we've been together, put together this bipartisan infrastructure bill. Jeff was key, a key leader in getting that done. He made sure he included the money for wild, wildfire prevention, help prevent and respond to fires like the thousands that burned a half a million acres, a half a million acres across Oregon last year. All those major fires that took place since I've been in office with FEMA, I've been in a helicopter from Fran on Northern California to these — across the northeast — the northwest and into uh, the state of uh, Idaho. And it's just devastating what's happened, what continues to happen. And Congressman Pete DeFazio, chair of the Transportation Committee, Pete's helped ensure that we're going to rebuild the country, and we buy American. We buy American. And look, the union workers in U.S. Steel, we're going to miss Pete. We're going to miss you, Pete. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I wish you weren't leaving. And Congressman Earl, where's Earl? Hey, Earl, thank you. Earl had me right here in a bicycle, uh, <laughs> but I don't mind. But I got a new one. I got, it's really not uh, a little race. Anyway, a critical voice in Congress when it comes to investing in infrastructure. Earl helped bring together labor and business to help get this done. And Congressman Kurt Schrader, he's, he's played a key part in the progress we've made as an jobs, economic growth, and clean energy. Thank you very much, pal. And he's strong and consistent voice to make sure we modernize our infrastructure and help Oregon and everyone all across America. You know, the last guy that had this job talked about Infrastructure Week. Every week he talked about Infrastructure Week. It didn't come for four years. Well, I gave you Infrastructure Decade. This is for 10 years. One trillion four and a billion dollars. And Suzanne, who works tirelessly to ensure that we have left out uh, — no one's left out uh, — you know, including women and people of color. We're not — we're building a better America. When I got elected, I said — and I meant it. People weren't sure I really meant it. But I said, I want my administration to look like America, to look like America. And it does. There are more women in my administration than men. There are more women in positions of consequence. There are more African-American judges that have been appointed than every other president combined has appointed. Folks, I want to thank you all for everything you're doing for the people of Oregon. We're here today to talk about investments we're making to modernize this airport and this an economic engine for the entire region. Though, uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're investing $25 billion to upgrade and modernize American airports out of the money that is the over trillion dollars we're spending in infrastructure. Airports all across America our second right. I used to tell the story that if, in fact, I dropped you in the middle of the night in an airport in China and an airport in the United States took a blindfold off and said, where you were, you'd think the one in China was in America. We are — we've fallen behind. We haven't invested in ourselves. And I want to thank Ron and Jeff, Peter, Earl, Kurt, Suzanne for helping prove that America can do big things again. We can do anything we want to do. Bothers the heck out of me that there's this belief that we can't do big things anymore. But we can. We're proving we can. And we must build a better America. And a good place to start is right here in Portland. Folks, look, Portland International Airport is a perfect example of both the need and the opportunity and the ability to make progress. I don't have to tell you that it's a central economic engine for the entire region, not just Portland. A lot of folks may not know it, but this airport employs 10,000 people, 10,000 people. Every day they show up, airline workers, technicians, retail workers, maintenance staff, and more. In addition, 20 million people travel from this airport every year, bringing 330,000 metric tons of cargo in and out of this state through this airport in the air, shipping seafood from Oregon to fishermen all across America all across the world, quite frankly, bringing goods from every corner of the country to Oregon homes and businesses. But here's the deal. It's been much too big and too long 
since America has invested in our own airports, our ports, and our rails. We haven't done it. We used to have the best infrastructure, rated the best infrastructure in the world. This is a fact. We are now ranked by the international community as 13th best infrastructure. 13, the United States. We've stopped investing in ourselves. We stopped investing in our people. We stopped investing in America. And I know people are tired of hearing me say it, but this time we're going to lead the world and invest in ourselves, invest in the nation, and invest in our people. That's the place to start. People kind of forget an American invented modern aviation. But like I said, we've allowed our airports to lag far behind our competitors. I remember when I was vice president, I was flying into New York to make a speech. And I landed in New York in Air Force Two in LaGuardia Airport. As I was walking through the terminal to get out to the vehicles, there was a sign on an escalator going to one of the gates saying that out of order, fixed in two months. Not a joke. The United States of America, one of the leading cities in the world, and it had a sign saying the escalator to the gate would take two months to be fixed. At that time, I said it took the average person, dropped them off, as I said, in LaGuardia or anywhere else. They'd wonder where in God's name they were. But look, they probably think they probably think they weren't in America if they didn't know better. But folks, by the way, LaGuardia has I caused a bit of a stir because I said it publicly what was happening. And guess what? The governor and legislature decided they had to change things. And they invested four billion dollars into one of the great destinations of the world, New York. The whole point of telling this story is I realize I'm preaching to the choir as we need to invest in American airports and here in Oregon. As I said earlier, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which I might add, I wrote the original one with my own paw. I wrote it, sat down and wrote it, because I was convinced there was no other answer other than to begin to invest in our country again. And we're investing $25 billion this year to modernize American airports all across this country and across this state, not just here. That includes $211 million this year in Oregon, $42 million being delivered this year alone, not just to modernize PDX, but for 50 additional airports across Oregon, because you've got more than one, as you all know. And that's in addition to the $20 million we invested in PDX last year. Look, here's just some of the what we're, this investment will do. First, thanks to Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley and, and Earl Bum, and Earl, excuse me, I know. You can call me Bidden, Joe Bidden, helping deliver a more resilient, state-of-the-art runway. You know, I don't have to tell you, anyone here in Oregon, it sits on a major earthquake zone. And, in fact, you had a, a 0.4 magnitude earthquake strike not far from here just two days ago. Imagine what would happen if that earthquake struck closer to the airport. It wouldn't just threaten lives. It would threaten to shut down the local economy for a heck of a lot of longer than two months it takes to fix an escalator. Folks, but your senators and congressmen are looking out for you. They fought to dedicate $3.75 million in the last month's omnibus bill to build a resilient runway here at PDX. The project is being modeled on the engineering of an airport that I happened to visit in Japan that remained operational in the face of a devastating earthquake and tsunami in 2011, successfully evacuating families and moving life-saving supplies because their runway was resilient. It was built resilient in the first place. Best of all, extensive research shows that every dollar we invest in our resilience of your runway will save $50 down the road by keeping this airport operational, safe, and efficient. But that's not all we're doing. You're in the midst of a $2 billion renovation to build a cutting-edge main terminal. I just saw an incredible component of that terminal being constructed. 392,000 square feet of roof being built out of what's known as mass timber, advanced engineering, wood design that you're pioneering right here in Oregon. And it won't just stay in Oregon. Almost every single piece of wood being used was substantially harvested from local forests. You can point to any beam, 
and the folks building it can tell you where it came from. Best of all, this project will support more than 1,250 good-paying jobs constructing the terminal. Over 95 percent of the construction is being done by union workers. Union. Someone criticized me, too, I guess it was now two months ago, said, you know, you, you use the word union more than all presidents combined. Well, there's a good reason for that. They're the best workers in the world. There's a reason why it makes sense to have a union worker. They train like it's like going to college to get that apprenticeship, not a joke. And in addition to that, they, are the, they get it done on time and with the best possible results you can get. We already nearly have 280 contracts amounting to $80 million have gone out to small businesses that are minority-owned and women-owned and veteran-owned, lifting up the economy for everyone. And this is just the start. Because of the infrastructure law, we're going to see modern baggage claim area, improved taxiways, and, yes, better escalators. And, you know, the investment all across Oregon is going to continue. Like was mentioned earlier by Coos Bay, you know, we've delivered nearly $33 million in January to modernize the main jetty making it safer and more efficient for ships, boaters, and fishermen. And improving the capacity of that port is something Ron Wyden and Pete DeFazio in particular have been fighting for for a long time. All across Oregon, we're sending the message. These ports and airports are open for more business. And we're seeing — and we're sending the same message, the same message about your roads and your bridges. Right now, there are nearly 400 bridges and about 1,300 miles of highway in poor condition just here in Oregon. It's estimated that driving on those roads that need repair cost Oregon drivers an extra $256 a year in gas repairs and longer commute times. That's a $256 hidden tax on Oregon drivers. And thanks to the infrastructure law, we're making the most significant investment to modernize roads and bridges in the last seven years since Eisenhower's interstate highway system. This year alone, we're delivering $662 million to fix roads and bridges in Oregon, plus an additional $53 million in dedicated funding for bridges. We're also going to start replacing 100 percent, 100 percent of the lead pipes and water, serve, and, wa and water lines that go into homes and schools in this country. You've got an estimated 14,000 lead service lines here in Oregon. Because of the infrastructure law, we're getting rid of the poisonous pipes and delivering $92 million to Oregon dollars to Oregon this year to provide clean and safe water. Because every American, every child, should be able to turn on a faucet, drink water that's clean, and also create thousands of good-paying jobs for plumbers and pipe fitters in the process. Folks, Ron and Jeff and Earl and Kurt and Suzanne, we all share a core belief that high-speed Internet is essential to success in the 21st century. But today, more than one in ten Oregon households don't have high-speed Internet. And the law delivers — this law delivers $100 million to Oregon to make high-speed Internet affordable and available everywhere in the state — urban, suburban, and rural — creating jobs for union technicians laying down those broadband lines. Never again should a parent have to sit in their car, drive to McDonald's parking lot, sit there with their child to get online so they can do their homework, which was happening during the pandemic. The law also builds up our resilience to extreme weather. Over the last decade, extreme weather has cost the state of Oregon at least $5 billion in damages. $5 billion. Our infrastructure law upgrades modernizing and strengthening transmission lines, helping communities to deal with floods, droughts, wildfires that are only coming with more frequency and ferocity. Folks, there's so much more in this law. We've made a lot of progress, and the fact is we have an incredible opportunity ahead of us. But we also know that families are still struggling with higher prices. I grew up in a family where, when the price of gasoline went up, it was a conversation at the kitchen table because it made a difference to my dad. We felt it. Let's be absolutely clear about why our prices are high now. Two reasons. First, COVID. The way the global economy works, if a factory in Vietnam makes a computer chip and shuts down due to COVID in Vietnam, the ripple effect can slow down automobile manufacturing in Detroit. So because of the pandemic, 
We've had disruptions in our supply of important materials. So prices went up. Just look at automobiles. Last year, they accounted for one-third of all the inflation in America. One-third was because of automobile companies couldn't get computer ships, and the price of automobiles skyrocketed because there was fewer significant demand because the economy was growing, but no availability. So I'm calling on Congress to pass the Bipartisan Innovation Bill to make more of these chips here at home and speed up the supply chains. And, folks, with regard to supply chains, let me say one thing. There's a little outfit called Intel. The chairman of the Board of Intel, Cassie, come and see me in Washington. And he said he wanted to invest $20 billion in a computer chip factory he was going to build just outside of Cleveland. $20 billion. He was going to create thousands of jobs building the facility and thousands of jobs running the facility. Average wage, once the facility was built, $132,000. This is — and now he's — if you guys pass and get me that other bill on my desk, he's prepared to invest another $100 billion — $100 billion — in that same facility. And what everybody forgets, we invented the damn thing. We invented the computer chip. Not a joke. And all the progress, all the change has come from American technology. We don't make them anymore, basically. But now we're changing that. The second big reason for inflation is gas prices. And it's Vladimir Putin's gas price increase. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has driven up gas prices and food prices all around the world. We saw that in the most recent inflation data. Last month, 70 percent of the increase in inflation was a consequence of Putin's price hike because of the impact on gas and energy prices. And doing everything I can to bring down the price to address Putin's price hike. That's why I authorized the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months of our, from our strategic petroleum reserve. And I worked with oil producers to ramp up production. I coordinated the release with our partners all around the world because I spent a lot of time with them. And they agreed. Over 30 countries agreed to release 60 million additional barrels over the same for another 240 million barrels over the next six months. The largest collective reserve release in history. Nations coming together to help deny ability to Putin to weaponize his energy resources against American families and families in Europe and around the world. And Americans should be seeing some savings, which are already seen in the price of gas coming down. But we need to do something else. We need to get off this roller coaster of relying on oil. We need to declare America's energy independence. We need to accelerate our path to clean renewable energy that includes adoption of electric adaptation of electric vehicles like cars, trains, school buses, and transit. We found new battery technology that is just amazing. Beyond the price, beyond gas prices, I've called on Congress to move immediately to lower the cost of families, utility bills, prescription drug costs, while lowering the deficit and reducing inflationary pressures. Folks, give me one example. There's over 200,000 children in America with type 1 diabetes. They need that vial of insulin all the time. If they don't get it, you know what the average cost for that is nationwide? $647. That's how much it costs them a month. Not only is a concern if you don't have the insurance, you don't have the income. Imagine being the parent, robbed of your dignity, knowing you don't have ability to help your child at all, and see what's happening. You know how much it costs them to make that one vial? Ten. T-E-N dollars. Ten dollars. With a little bit of help, and I know my colleagues support me, with a little bit of help, and a few Republicans getting out of the way, in the United States Congress, because none of them are helping, we can lower that price to $35 a month, and they still make three and a half times what they pay for. Make a difference in families' lives. We can do it without raising taxes a penny and anyone making under $400,000. No one making under four hundred grand see a penny in their taxes go up. That's the best way Congress can address inflation right now lower the cost of other things for people, everyday people working like hell just to keep food on the table. Let me close with this. When I was running for office, I'm sure you heard me say a thousand times, 
I was going to build this economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Because when that happens, everybody does well. The wealthy do very, very well. The poor have a way up, and the middle class can grow. As my dad was saying, just have a little bit of breathing room. Just a little bit of breathing room. So we're going to deal in the people and the places that have been left out and left behind. We're making progress. Over the course of my presidency, our recovery has created 7.9 million jobs. More jobs created over the first 14 months of my presidency than any presidency in American history. Over 420,000 manufacturing jobs. Who says we can't manufacture our way through all of this? We are the best workers in the world. Not a joke. Unemployment nationwide is at 3.6%, down from 6.4% when I took office 19 months ago. The fastest decline in unemployment is the start of a term of a president ever recorded. Oregon, you just added 122,000 jobs, and unemployment has dropped from 6.4% to 3.8%. Last year, and during all this time, don't listen to my Republican friends in Congress, last year, we reduced, my budget reduced the, the deficit by $350 billion. Hear me? We didn't spend, we didn't increase the deficit a penny. We reduced it by $350 billion. And the budget I submitted, we're on our way to getting done this year in 2022. We're on track to reduce the deficit by more than $1 trillion, $300 billion. $1 trillion, $300 billion the largest one-year reduction of deficit in American history. It's particularly important now as we work to reduce the pressure on inflation. Oregon and America have gone from being on the mend to being on the move. We just got to get the hell out of our own way. So we're coming, we're coming forward with challenges, challenges from strength, positions that we're in, not like we've been before. I'm more optimistic about America's potential today than I've been any time in my career. And I've been doing this job in national politics for a long time. Because I see a future that is without a limit. I mean, this is the United States of America, for God's sake. We're the only nation in the world. This is a fact. Look it up. The only nation in the world that's come out of every crisis stronger than when we went into the crisis. Stronger. Every single time. I was with Xi Jinping. I've traveled with 17,000 miles of them and spent more time with any other world leader over a total of, I think, and we're up to 90-some hours of talking or meeting together over the last six, seven years. And we were in the foothills of the Tibet, and he asked me, he said, I had a translator, and he had a simultaneous translator. And he said, can you define America for me? This is a true story. He repeats it. I said, yeah, I can, in one word. And he looked at me, I said, what do you mean, in one word? I said, possibilities. Anything's possible in America. Anything's possible. And that's what we're exactly we're going to do today. Do what we are capable of doing. Stop feeling sorry for ourselves. Get the hell up and take this country back in a way that we lead the world again, because we can do it. We're on the way to doing it. And with the help of your delegation, we're going to get it done. I mean it. There's nothing beyond our capacity. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it.